Hello everyone. So for this next part of chapter 11, we will be talking about civil assessment for personal injury cases. So some definitions here that we really need to get on board with. So a tort is a civil wrong one commits against another that there's some remedy possible. It's a legal claim or complaint in the form of a lawsuit. The plaintiff is the injured party. They're the one asking the court to do something about it. The defendant is the accused. Liability here is where you determine if the defendant was legally responsible for something that happened to the plaintiff. And the court makes that decision. Psychologists are not involved in this step. That's just beyond our expertise. When we get involved, it's already clear that the defendant has liability in some way. So where do we get involved? Decisions about damages. This is where the court will ask the defendant to do something to make right the wrongs done to the plaintiff by way of compensation. So this is where psychologists get involved. We look at psychological and or emotional damage and we link it to the act of the defendant. So some assessment tasks we do here is we have to assess psychological functioning. Uh, the current psychological functioning at the time that we are asked to get involved in the case. So we have a special interest in distress, psychopathology, maladjustment. So if we find these problems, the court wants to know the extent to which these problems resulted from the accident or other actions of the defendant. Uh, and sometimes this can, the defendant could be an insurance company. And the defendant wants you to say you can't establish a link. So you're trying to do retrospective assessment here, and as we've talked about before, that's really difficult. Um, and in these cases, it's often years beforehand, and you're trying to reconstruct it. So uh, you're getting psychological functioning from whatever data you can find. You uh, have to become a detective and figure out possible ways you can get information uh, from the plaintiff, the employer, the family, the neighbors, records, if they had previous psychological tests done, great. That's a rarity, obviously. Just because they were fragile before, doesn't mean the incident didn't cause additional damage. That's really important to keep in mind. You wanna be careful because there could have been an impairment right after the incident, but due to the time elapsed before you get to evaluate them, it may no, no longer be present or as obvious. What has been the course of the psychological status from the time of the incident until now is really the question you're asking and answering. They could have been impaired for some period of time, even if they're in full remission now. And they could still get damages for that. We want to look at the nature of the incident or incidents alleged to call damages, to cause the damages. People will readily talk about this. Uh, you need to look at it in terms of the distress compared to the average person. You want to get as much data as possible that help determine if the distress is attributable to that particular incident. Then you want to look at the cause-effect relationship between the current deficits in functioning and whatever that incident or incidents were. Opinion with reasonable psychological certainty that the deficit is caused by the incident. You want to look at pre- to post-incident functioning and consider any other incidents that may have happened since then or before then. You need to consider alternate explanations and hypotheses because that's how your report or you, if you were asked to testify, will be attacked. You wanna demonstrate in your report and in your testimony that your hypothesis makes more sense than anything else. You'll be asked to assign probability values to your judgments, most likely, uh, and we just can't do that as psychologists. Psychologists should stand their ground and say that they cannot do that. You can say it's highly likely that your explanation is true. Um, for cases like workman's comp or uh, service connection in the VA, a percentage is assigned, and that's really difficult to do. And if you are not the one assigning it, it's really difficult to dispute in some way. 
The prognosis is also important. So does the person actually need treatment? How long will it take? What will the cause be? Will it actually help? You really have to look for malingering because like in criminal cases, there's a really strong motivation to do so here and it's money. This will almost always be an issue you have to address when you're in personal injury cases. The FBS or fake bad scale of the MMPI was specifically designed to help identify people malingering in personal injury cases. So pay a special attention to this. It doesn't work well in identifying emotional malingering it's more likely to relate it to genuine distress. It's great for the defense. They can try to use it, but you have to educate juries about the fact that it doesn't actually work the way it's supposed to. So what's the assessment timeline here? First, you're gonna get the referral from the attorney and get a basic description of the case. Uh, you get referring and opposing counsel's theories and supporting facts as well. Then the examiner provides uh, practice, expertise, availability, and fee information to the attorney. And the attorney client provides informed consent and pays the psychologist a retainer. You review records on both sides, and then you do your first interview. You're going to do a brief introductory interview of the plaintiff. You're going to ask for collateral contact information and documents. Then you'll do in-office testing of the plaintiff give them take-home history questionnaires. And then you're going to review those questionnaires and their test results and any remaining records. And then you do interview number two, which is your case substantive interview of the plaintiff. You'll conduct your collateral interviews, do additional interviews with the plaintiff as necessary, and then review your data and results. So you wanna look at it and organize it in the following way. First, pre-allegation history, strengths and competencies, pre-existing vulnerabilities, pre-existing impairments and functioning, and then talk about trauma and distress. What was the plaintiff exposed to? And talk about the sequelae, substantial impairments in functioning that the plaintiff suffered, ways in which the plaintiff has been resilient. I want to talk about proximate cause, impairments that would not have occurred but for the alleged events and impairments that might have occurred otherwise. We want to talk about prognosis as well. The degree of future impairments, partial or complete, temporary or permanent, and interventions or accommodations that this person will need. Then you have conclusions, uh, your opinions and recommendations. You can consult with colleagues as needed here. Um, you want to consult with the retaining client attorney. You will write a report if requested. Again, as we've talked about throughout the semester, this will be examined microscopically, so you need to be prepared to defend every sentence in the report. Again, the importance of learning to write well. One little thing can destroy your credibility, so less is better here. You wanna make it concise and clear. Then you enter the step of discovery. The first step is a subpoena, where you send everything you have to the other attorney. The second step is a deposition, a deposition, uh, and you're ordered to appear and be questioned by the lawyers. This is similar to court. You're, there's no judge presence, but you do take an oath, um, and usually your side's attorney is there. Uh, and the really interesting thing about this, and I've actually been deposed in a case before, and the really interesting thing about this is that the lawyers can object, but there's no judge there to rule on whether or not that objection is sustained. So you have to answer even if they object. So even if they ask you something that's really absurd. So for example, I was essentially a character witness in the trial where I was deposed, but they started trying to use me as an expert witness because they knew I was a psychologist. And certainly the lawyer objected to that, but there was no one to rule on it, so I had to answer those questions anyway. Um, you want to be really careful what you say in the deposition because you have to say the exact thing, same thing if you are to testify in court. You want to also not perjure yourself. And if you don't know the answer, you can really say, I don't know or I don't recall, and that's all right. And really only one or two in 10 cases end up in court. So then if you are called on to testify in court, you have to be very realistic about your own credentials and expertise. You do not want to stretch or overstate. You want to always be honest. If you don't know, if you're not sure, again, say that. 
If you don't understand what you're being asked, say that and ask them to say it again. Don't volunteer anything. Your role is to provide information the lawyer that retained you wanted you to provide in court and to answer questions honestly. So related to this is workers' comp evals. This is when someone's been hurt on the job and files claims for damages. Uh, and these are usually physical as well as psychological. This is not a judicial proceeding. There's an administrative judge often appointed by the governor. This can be appealed to higher levels of workers' comp, workers comp administration. Um, and you do the same kinds of assessments we just talked through. The Workers' Comp Bureau doesn't have enough psychologists to do these evaluations, so they usually contract with other psychologists. Uh, also, if a worker is dissatisfied with the evaluation, they can get an independent evaluation, and the Workers' Comp Bureau is the client if they hire you, not the person in the room. You usually don't get a lot of money for these evaluations. And if workers are compensated, the size of the award they receive is determined by the type and duration of the injuries and their salary at the time of the injury. So workers can seek compensation for physical and psychological injuries suffered at work, the cost of whatever treatment is given, lost wages, and the loss of future earning capacity. Clinicians are often asked to render an opinion about the existence, cause, and implications of any mental disorders. So claims for mental disability usually arise in one of two ways. There's the physical mental cases where a physical injury can lead to a mental disorder and a psychological disability. And there's mental mental cases where an individual might suffer a traumatic incident at work that leads to significant uh, psychological difficulties. In recent years, there's been a surge in these mental mental cases. Why? Well, it's perhaps due to the rise in female workers because women are more often diagnosed with anxiety and depressive disorders, but we also know that they are more likely to be the focus of any type of harassment. It's perhaps due to the shift in the job market from manufacturing or industrial jobs to service orienting jobs. So that leads to increases in job related interpersonal stressors, fewer physical risks, and it's perhaps motivated by financial incentives. Next, we're going to talk briefly about civil competence. And the question of civil competence focuses on whether an individual has the capacity to understand information that is relevant to decision making in a given situation and then make a choice about what to do in that situation. So here are some of the questions that address issues of civil competence. Is one competent to manage his or her financial affairs? Can one make competent decisions about medical or psychiatric treatment? Is one competent to execute a will and decide how to distribute property? Can one make advanced decisions about medical treatment if terminally ill or seriously injured? These are often referred to as advanced medical directives. A competent individual is expected to be able to understand the basic information that's relevant to making the decision, apply that information to a specific situation in order to anticipate the consequences of various choices, use logical or rational thinking to evaluate the pros and cons of various strategies and decisions, and communicate the personal decision or choice. The question of competence to consent to treatment can arise when one refuses treatment that seems unjustified or justified. If simplifying the information doesn't help, then one can administer a clinical assessment instrument. So there's the MacArthur Competence Assessment Tool for Treatment Decisions to determine whether the patient lacks the necessary ability to reach a competent decision. Clinicians can evaluate whether a person, in this case called the testator, was competent to execute a will, for example. So, and such competence is then required for the will to be valid. So these evaluations include a determination of the purpose of the will and why it was written at that time, information on property holdings, information and insight into the family dynamics, and an assessment of the general consequences of these dispositions. So that is this part. Uh, next, we're going to talk about employment discrimination and harassment, but I'll do that in a separate video, again, to keep these in digestible bites.